Okay, if you go ahead and open up your Bibles and your Articles of Faith, uh, we're going to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are currently studying the Lord's Supper uh, from our two church ordinances, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then we will hopefully conclude it today uh, with a summary of the both of them. Uh, it's important to understand that these two ordinances are church ordinances. They are not just, let's go off and do these ordinances ourselves and, and have some random group come together. It is, it is imperative that it is the Lord's church that are observing these. Otherwise, you're just getting wet. Otherwise, you're just taking a piece of bread and a piece of uh, juice uh, and drinking and eating them and, and washing yourself outwardly. Uh, but for it to be of spiritual significance, you have to do them with the Lord's body. You have to do them and observe them with a serious heart. Uh, you have to do them uh, outwardly because they are outward symbols. Uh, but you also have to have them internally affecting your spirit and soul. So let's go ahead and look at Romans uh, Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start in verse 17. We've already reviewed our paragraphs previous weeks. It says in verse 17, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. What is it that we come together for? When we come together for church, is it to, is it to edify one another or find out the latest gossip? Is it to come together to uh, fight against our brethren and, and say, well, they don't, they don't believe the truth, and therefore I'm going to fight against them, uh, and I'm going to oppose them, I'm going to purge them? No, it's to say, uh, find in me any secret faults and secret sins. Like David said, he didn't go to the Lord's house to look at others and say, you, you're, you have heresies, you have evil surmisings, you have all these things. It's important because we don't stand before God, you know, before each other in that sense, but rather submitting one to another in the spirit. We stand before the Lord, our master. Uh, it is before the Lord that we rise and fall. And so it's more imperative, not that, yes, you can be that person just as David had uh, had a prophet that stood before him and said, thou art the man. Uh, it's important to have that uh, confrontation, if you will, for somebody who refuses to judge themselves, if you will. But judgment starts at the house of God. It starts, first of all, in the spirit with our own selves. Uh, take care of the moats in your own eye, then you can, uh, the beam in your own eye, then you can help your brother with the moats in their eye. It's not that you ignore the beam or that you ignore the moats in your brother's eye, but rather you take care of your own first and then you take care of others afterwards. Yes, there are things that we're constantly working on, but as we mentioned last week, uh, it is a, the importance is that not that we are perfect before we take care of other people's issues, but rather that we acknowledge our issues and allow the Lord to work on them. And as we are being worked on those issues in submission and, and uh, focusing on the Lord, we help our brothers and sisters to do the same. In edification. So when we come together, it's not to uh, accuse one another or, or to uh, cast down or look down upon somebody who's struggling, but rather in edification, say, I acknowledge and, I, and you acknowledge that you have these issues with the body and that you are working on them in, with focus on the Lord and that you are helping each other. The Bible says to bear your burdens and then the burdens of others. Uh, you don't go and, and uh, not take care of your own issues without taking care of your own, but rather you take care of your own and then you help each other with theirs uh, in edification. We don't point out people's sins to cast them down or to cast them out, but the whole process, even if somebody refuses to deal with their sin and that we have to allow them to, to remove them from the uh, membership, that is not so that they stay removed. Uh, it is important to allow space for repentance, allow space for them to get right with the Lord and to be rejoined to the body. Uh, and those who are uh, true heretics will not be rejoined, uh, but those who are uh, just in rebellion to the Lord and they know what ought to be right, uh, the space uh, for repentance, the, the, the space away from the body is to allow Satan to, 
to ravage them until they acknowledge that they need the body uh, and submit in humbleness. Because sometimes a lot of people are too proud. Well, I don't agree with the church on this issue. I don't agree with the church on that issue. They're too proud. They think that they're standing with the truth when, uh, when they're really just standing with their own pride. Uh, and they don't acknowledge, say, yes, I had this issue, I had this disagreement, but the body is more important than my issue or my disagreement. Uh, yes, there are things that will cause you to uh, depart from a body that perhaps is not doing right. But the goal is, whether you are wrong or the body is wrong, uh, that we come together to resolve those issues. If everybody, if a, if a church is wrong on an issue, and everybody who disagrees with that issue departs the church, and there's no fight, well, wonderful, they have no fight. But then that church stays wrong on that issue, and heresies grow. But yet, if the person who is wrong on an issue depart, and they go off someplace where another church who is also wrong on that issue, and they join together, that issue is not resolved. But if the body works together and does those tough conversations, which the body ought to be doing, uh, rather than ignore them and, or uh, thinking that the problem doesn't exist, uh, we need to face those situations and deal with them. If I have a problem with something, if something I'm teaching uh, is not in agreement with the body, and the body says, hey, pastor, this is not what we agree with, this is, there's an issue here, something's not quite right here, then we need to have those conversations, not just for the body's sake, but also for the individual's sake. Uh, and a lot of times people say, well, he's the pastor. He, he won't listen to me. Uh, well, I need to be in, in a spiritual state to where I can listen to the, the body. And if there's a reason where I, I think that I'm correct and the body's not, I need to humbly submit to acknowledging, hey, where's the issue there? And we need to work that out to find a common ground. Uh, here in this passage, it says, if any, he says, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. We need to come together for the better. Uh, that's important. Uh, he says, first of all, when you come together in church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Here the church is joined together. Amen. Wonderful. They're all joined together. But they're teaching and preaching completely different things. When, when uh, so-and-so stands up, he's preaching this doctrine. And then, and then when so-and-so stands up, he's preaching the opposite, uh, and so forth. And they are not in agreement. But, oh, they're in unity. Hey, they're, they're, they're coming together. You know, you need to have truth and unity together. You cannot just have truth and everybody fighting with one another and departing and splitting and, and, and all this stuff. And you can't have unity with heresy. You have to have both together. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod for correction, the staff for uh, bringing together. And so we, we see that there's two in the hands of the Lord, the rod and the staff. And we need to have both. We can't have one or the other. We can't have to the point where we're unified but in complete disagreement and divisions, and we have cliques here and there and everywhere uh, over opinions, over doctrines, over this, and yet, oh, but we're, we're worshiping together. No, you have to be in unity. And that's what the Lord's Supper is about, being in unity with the New Testament and with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand the importance of both being correct. First of all, when you come together in church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. I believe this, that you're coming together, but there's divisions among you. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. Notice this. There has to be heresies. It's just part of natural growth. You're not going to have a church where there's not going to be heresy. There's not going to be, uh, and heresy in this in the section means basically uh, somebody who is not going to agree with the body. You know, whenever you have a church vote, how often times is it unanimous? Uh, usually, if you, when you get a certain amount of people in the church body, it's going to be uh, maybe 90% this, and there's always going to be like a 10% disagreement and that stuff. But, uh, uh, and, and so there's always going to be some sort of disagreement. But the question is, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with it? Uh, and the, the Lord's Supper is partly how you deal with this. You have to say, hey, uh, is, there, is, the degree, is the disagreement because I'm not obeying the truth? Or is it because the body is? And, and you have to confront these things. 
when you come together into one place, this is not to eat, he says, that, uh, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So they that which are approved. When you deal with the hard things you'll, you, and you submit to the Spirit, the truth will always win out. How often times do you, uh, when somebody tries to suppress one opinion or the other, uh, oh, well, that, that opinion's hateful, so we're going to suppress that. We're going to censor that. Uh, it, it, yeah, there are some things in the church that we simply will not deal with. I mean, if somebody comes in here and says, Jesus is not Lord. Jesus is, is just a created being. These are things that we don't even have to discuss or debate about. Uh, they either have to correct themselves or leave. Uh, the, there are some things that are so blatantly obvious to, to, the, uh, to the person who submitted to the Spirit. But then there are opinions, there are slight differences, different opinions. When does this thing occur? When does this happen? What is the timeline of this? You know, uh, minor issues of doctrinal importance. Uh, not, not minor in the sense that we need to have correct doctrine, but minor in the sense that ultimately when we get to heaven, uh, the Lord's not going to care how sharp your sickle was, but ra rather how much work you did. Uh, so, so here it says, uh, so that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when you have these discussions, uh, the truth will, uh, will be approved. The, the person who is speaking the truth will win out in that discussion. When there are free and open conversations, uh, the truth will always win out. When somebody tries to suppress one opinion or the other uh, in the body, then they never have that opportunity to have those free and open discussions to where the truth will work in the believer. If everyone has a spirit within them, they are saved, they are believers, and they are dealing with these conversations, the Holy Spirit will make manifest in their heart what is the truth. But if they don't deal with them, then they can't be made manifest. And so it, it's difficult. Sometimes you can resolve an issue quickly within, with one meeting or with one discussion. Uh, other times it takes longer study because sometimes foundational truths have to be learned before you can uh, understand the more intricacies of prophecy. Uh, so if you, for example, if you think that the, the church is Israel or Israel is the church uh, or they're not separate or what your opinion is on it, prophecy is going to change because the things that are applied to uh, Israel in prophecy, you might think, oh, well, that's now for the church or things that are applied to the church. You'll think, well, now that's for Israel in the future. Uh, so opinions and differences on, on your foundational will determine your opinions and differences on other things. And so until the body can get on the same page foundationally with the fundamentals, that's why we focus as a Baptist church on the fundamentals, a fundamental Baptist church. Uh, if we get those fundamentals right, then the, then the things that are built upon that, that are built upon Christ, built upon that foundation, uh, that cornerstone, those things will fall into proper place. But if you try to deal with these things that are, found, are not foundational, but you got the foundation wrong, then they're going to fall all over the place. And so it's important to work on those fundamentals before, until you, before you can finally get to the, the, the doctrinal nuances and intricacies of what is this and what is that. And so here it says that they may be approved, may be manifest among you. When ye come together, verse 20, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and he is hungry, and another is drunk. And notice here, they're taking together their own supper. When they're coming together in unity or in the body, uh, one is going off in one place, having his own supper. I am having the Lord's Supper by myself. I am doing this to, by myself. No, the Lord's Supper is not some separate thing where you go off. Uh, like, like there is this. Here's an example. Uh, there is this person uh, who was door knocking in our neighborhood one time when we first moved uh, to Kalamazoo, uh, and I opened the door and she says, "Hello, I'm from such and such church. I would like to come in and have communion with you and your family. Is that okay?" I was like, uh, "No, thank you. We take communion with our own church. Thank you very much." 
Uh, and so, uh, so she was like, okay. She had these little wafer, had a little cup with a wafer on it, and she was carrying those in. And she was going door knocking to every little church or every little house on our street. And she was saying, would you like to take the Lord's Supper? Uh, first of all, if somebody's lost and you're taking the Lord's Supper with them as a, as a soul winning tool, you, you're they're eating and drinking damnation to themselves. How how would you uh, like somebody come up to your door and say, mind if I shoot you? No, you, you don't want to do that. And mind if you stick your hand in an electric socket? No, you don't want to do those things. You have to do those things properly. Uh, somebody cannot just show up to some random place and have the Lord's Supper. That's your own supper. I don't know that person. I didn't know that person. I didn't know that church. Maybe, maybe they were a decent enough church. Who knows? But they were using the Lord's Supper, the communion, improperly. Uh, they were not using it for the, the whole, but for individuals. Uh, and so the Lord's Supper is not a segmented, you, your little church group over here, your little Sunday school over there, your little uh, hospital room over here, and your little house over here. That's not the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for the body, the local church. Uh, and so it says, first of all, it says, it says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You guys are coming together in one place, but you're not eating the Lord's Supper. You're eating your own little supper. You're, you're not gathering together. Well, I'm holy before the Lord, and therefore I can take of the Lord's Supper. Uh, but here it says, everyone before the other his, taketh before the other his own supper. And one is hungry, and the other is drunken. One is hungry. He didn't get any bread. The other is drunken because he got too much wine, uh, too much alcohol or whatever. Uh, and so they're taking the bread, and then the one is satisfying themselves with the bread, eating all of this bread. And the Lord's Supper, you know, when I was a little kid, I was like, why do we take the Lord's Supper and we only get this little piece of this and a little piece of that? It's because it's not an actual meal. It, it's symbolic. Uh, and it's not so that one can uh, feast on pizza and have uh, orange soda pop, you know, or, or grape soda pop, you know. Uh, it's not a party. It's not something to where you're just going to get full on. Uh, but here in this passage, they were treating it as a meal. Uh, and yet they were, take, they were coming from home with their own packaged lunch, if you will. And they're going to say, we're here for the Lord's Supper. One person says, oh, I didn't know it was the Lord's Supper today. Uh, and then they show up with, uh, with, without a, a meal. And then everybody else is eating a meal with them. It, it's kind of like when Jesus uh, had the loaves, and, the loaves and the fishes, the little boy with the loaves and the fishes, and when they were hungry. Jesus didn't say, well, just the little boy with the meal can, uh, can eat. But rather, he blessed it, and then everybody was able to eat. And so... Here in this passage, we see that they come together, one, one before the other, his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So they were taking the Lord's Supper, not only just as a meal, but also as one that, uh, that wasn't regarding the other person. They were only regarding themselves. Well, I am holy before the Lord, and therefore I am good before the Lord. Uh, no, the Lord's Supper is not for individual participation only, but rather for a, the body participation, those who are baptized believers. For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Hey, if you want to take the Lord's Supper like that, or you want to have some little thing with your church fa with your, your family... Uh, your physical family, uh, to show them the, if you want to go to your family and say, son and daughter and, and, and mother and, and, and husband, uh, this is what the Lord's Supper represents. You can do that. That's fine. It's, it's not heresy to, to teach your family what the Lord's Supper means. But that's not the Lord's Supper. That's showing them what the examples are. Uh, but the Lord's Supper, the true Lord's Supper is when you come together as a body. He says, he says, what have ye not houses to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I, shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Oh, look at them. They're coming together, and they're, they're participating in the Lord's Supper. No, you're doing it not as a body, but as individuals. Should I praise you in that? No, I shouldn't praise you in that. Uh, yeah, wonderful. You, you guys sanctify your own little family, and you sanctify your own little group. 
Uh, you come together in the church, uh, but you only go into your little clique or your own little Sunday school room and you take up the Lord's Supper while not waiting for the whole body. He says, for I have received of the Lord. He says, I praise you not for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So when we're coming together, it's not to eat, eat supper, uh, not to have a meal, not to have our own little group. But he said, it's to represent the body. He says, take, eat. This is my body. And when he said, take, eat, he didn't just say to one disciple. He said to all of the disciples there at the table. Uh, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance for me. So when we take of the Lord's Supper, we take that bread first, and then we say, take, eat, this is my body. So it represents his body. The body is the local church there. The, the body is the whole body. Not, not just a piece of the, the bread, but it's the whole piece of bread. It says, take this, my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup when it, he had supped, saying, This cup is, a new test, is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So here we have the bread, uh, which it represents the body. And then we have the, the wine, which represents the New Testament. Uh, so in this picture, we, we see that we are taking the Lord's Supper with the body. And we are taking the Lord's Supper uh, in remembrance of His New Testament. So we don't take it in regards to uh, circumcision or in regards to uh, the Passover with the Old Testament, believe, uh, Old Testament church or the Old Testament Israel. We don't take it in regards to the Old Testament covenant. And so these people that try to say, well, the, the Lord's Supper is, is still the Passover. No, they're, they're illustrations, but it's in regards to the New Testament, not the Old Testament or the Israelite covenant. So here it says the, the Lord's body, not the, not the Israelite body, not the uh, Old Testament body, but rather it is the Lord's body of the New Testament that we are taking the supper with. For as oft as you drink the bread and drink the cup. So notice this, it says as oft. Some people take it every Sunday. Some people take it uh, quarterly. Other people take it yearly. Uh, typically, I'm the one who tends to take it yearly. But it doesn't matter how often the church wants to do it. But when they do it, they need to do it carefully. They need to do it wisely. They need to do it in remembrance of the Lord's death. Notice here it says, for as oft as ye drink the bread and this drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. So notice it's the body and the New Testament is showing the Lord's death. It is the body was broken for us, and his blood shed gives us the New Testament. And so we see here that the Lord's Supper does not start with the Old Testament or Israel or with the with the Passover or with circumcision or with anything of the Old Testament, but rather it starts with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. When he shed his blood on that cross, when his body was broken for us on that cross, that was the picture of the Lord's Supper. And yes, it started and it has a picture in the Old Testament Passover, uh, but it is a new start. It is the, it is the, the Old Testament was the shadow and the body and blood of Jesus Christ is the picture. It is the thing the shadow pointed to. It is the center point of Christianity. Those who look towards the cross, look towards the body, the coming body and blood of Jesus Christ to shed it for many. Those sacrifices, the Passover sacrifices, uh, the lamb shed on those doorposts for everybody, symbolized and pictured what they looked forward to, which was the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand the importance of the symbolism. Uh, we show the Lord's death until he come. And so this is not to show the Passover, escape from Egypt. It is to show Easter. It is to show the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the body of Jesus Christ until he come. And of course, he came from the dead. We know that. And then he will come again uh, in like manner of his departure. 
Uh, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup, not of the Old Testament, but of the Lord, that Lord is Jesus Christ, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup unworthily. So how would you eat and drink the blood blood and body of Jesus Christ unworthily? First of all, you're not a believer. That would be somebody who's unworthy, because you, you do not believe in the death of Jesus Christ for our sin, and therefore you're not a believer. See, the believer believes that Jesus Christ died for them. And so the Lord's Supper shows their faith in Christ. So if you don't believe in the faith of Christ, you should not be eating the Lord's Supper. So if that person, that individual, that Christian came to my door and I was not a believer, and they asked if I would take of the bread and, and blood of Christ through those symbols, then I would be unworthy. And they would be causing me to eat unworthily of the Lord's Supper because they acknowledge understand it represents the death of Christ, and that those who eat of it believe in the death of Christ, uh, then they would be causing me to eat and drink damnation to myself. Now, obviously, it's just bread and it's just wine. Is the bread anything? Is, is the wine anything? No, but it is uh, just as somebody who sacrifices to idols, so to somebody who eats unworthily is drinking, eating and drinking damnation to themselves. He shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So if you're not worthy of it, but you're acknowledging that's what they represent, then you are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Examine yourself. So the purpose of the symbols here uh, is to examine ourselves. Who shall, uh, he says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So notice there it's one bread, one cup. Yeah, we have the little, you know, today we have the little separate cups and stuff, but we pour it from one cup. <laughs> you know, we pour it from one, one bottle. Uh, the Welch's doesn't come in individual packs. We pour it from the, the Welch's bottle or whatever it is that we do. Uh, so we understand that. He says, but little, he says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, and notice this, not discerning the Lord's body. So when you come together and you treat it as a meal, you, you treat it as something you do by yourself, you treat it as something, if you're not a believer, and you, you treat it as just some symbolic act, then you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. You are, you are making a mockery of the symbols of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm not for open communion, because you're eating and drink. if you're not unworthy, if you're not worthy, then you shouldn't be eating of it. And so it's for the body to come together as often as we do it, to examine ourselves, not each other, but ourselves. And then after we've examined ourselves and say, Lord, these are the things that I need to work on. Lord, I discern your body. Lord, I acknowledge in faith that I am a believer. And I also acknowledge in faith that there are things that I need to work on in my life. And Lord, as I take this body, I take this blood, I pray, Lord, that you would use it to cleanse me and to help me. There's the washing of the water of the word. As the, as the symbols, as I join together with this body, help me to submit one to another in the spirit of the Lord, discerning your death until you come, and that I may be able to work on these things to be more like you. You are what you eat, if you, if, uh, as the saying goes. He says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Why? Because they are, they are taking of the Lord's Supper, but yet they are not being the body and blood of Christ. They are taking the, they are taking the Lord's Supper, or claiming to, but they are taking it unworthily. People that are not true believers, people who are not, uh, who are not discerning the Lord's body, people who are not discerning the Lord's New Testament, uh, they are eating and drinking with heresies, they are eating and drinking with divisions, and therefore, see, it's not the, because they partake of a piece of bread or a piece of, uh, a, a piece of drink, but rather because as they are doing those things, they are not using the Lord's Supper uh, to help them focus on Christ. They're doing it only as a mere act. Uh, and so just as, somebody would come to, just as somebody would come to church but not listen to the sermon, so to somebody taking the bread 
and the body of Christ uh, and the, the blood and the New Testament and just saying, well, I, I'm taking these symbols, but I'm not going to live my life with the body of Christ. I'm not going to live my life with, with the New Testament in mind. And I'm not going to discern the Lord's death until I come. He says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. See, if the body is not focused on the Lord's death, focused on the body of Christ, as, as we live our life, are we focused on the local church? Are we focused on living out the great commission of the New Testament? Are we focused on those things as a body? Or are we doing our own things? Are we a social club? Because if you are a true church, focusing on the Lord and pre proclaiming His death and, and death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, together in unity, then you'll be a strong church. But if you have divisions and heresies among you, but you don't use the Lord's Supper to resolve those issues, you'll be a weak church, and many of you will be sick because the wolves are picking you off one by one. It's not some superstitious thing to where uh, that the, the body is mystically, oh, I took a piece of bread, but I didn't. No, it's because you are allowing the heresies to continue, you're allowing the divisions to continue, and you're not using the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the, the Lord's Supper, to resolve those issues. That's why people are sick. That's why people are dying, because the wolves of the devil are picking them off. They are not a strong church. So let's use our Lord's Supper as, as a way to form us together. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You got to discern one another. You have to be together in unity in the Lord's local church. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, why, why are they weak and sick? They did not judge themselves when they took the Lord's Supper. We should not be judged. Judge ourselves first, so we won't be judged of others, uh, and so that the, the devil can't get into us. But when we are judged, we are, what? notice this, chastened of the Lord. Allow that chastening. The divisions are there, and there are heresies among you. But if we use the Lord's Supper properly, the truth will be manifest, and those who are approved to lead the church will be manifest. And we will be chastened of the Lord, because we've judged ourselves, and we have allowed that chastening to come through. We've discerned the Lord's body, that we should not be condemned, notice this, with the world. So you see, if you're taking the Lord's Supper with lost people, open communion, then you will be damned of yourselves. You will be condemned. But if you are taking it with the Lord's body, the local church, and you are judging yourselves, you're using that for unity and to resolve heresies and issues and divisions among yourselves, and you're coming together in unity, discerning the Lord's body, and discerning the New Testament, then you will not be condemned with the world. Why? Because you're already believers, and you're in unity, and you're a strong church. Wherefore, my brother, when ye come together to eat, this is the Lord's Supper, tarry one for another. Notice this, tarry one for another. If I'm open communion, or if I'm close communion, how can I tarry for my brother? Do I know of a visitor from another local church that I'm in close communion with? Do I know that he's going to be in my local congregation? How can I tarry for that person? Do I know that person? No, I don't. Can I be in unity with that person if I don't know him personally? No, I can't. That's why we are close, closed communion. Uh, because, first of all, you cannot be unsaved, which would be open communion. Uh, and you cannot be of like faith and yet of a different church. Because this local body doesn't know you, who you are and we can't tarry for you. We don't know you. So here it says, tarry one for another. Now, I, I oftentimes say this, that I am, not, uh, I am not closed communion, as in we lock the doors and turn out the lights and, and huddle around a, a little candle and say, yeah, let's take the Lord's Supper so nobody else knows. Uh, I'm of one of the, the doors closed but not locked, if you will. I'm not going to, if you will, police the Lord's Supper because we're supposed to examine ourselves. You know if you're part of this church. You know if you're part of this body. I'm not going to have some deacon come along and slap your hand away if, uh, if you take a piece of bread or, or a, piece of, uh, a, a you know, piece of grape juice. That's not the point. The point is to examine yourselves. Are you part of the Lord's body? Are you willing to be submitted to this Lord's body? Uh, and so the closed communion in the sense that, yes, we know who our, our members are, and they know who their membership, where their membership is, and we need to tarry one for another. 
Uh, so if your name is Terry, we're waiting for you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so Terry, one for another. Uh, so here it says, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. We need to find a time. Yeah, yeah, we schedule it because that way everybody knows. But we'd like to find a time when everybody can be together. In the Old Testament, when they took the Lord's Passover, uh, they had a scheduled time every month that they took the Passover together. They, they waited as a nation together. And then if somebody couldn't take it that month because they were traveling or they were inconvenienced or they couldn't get together, there was another time a month later to where they could take that. Uh, but they had to take at least one, uh, schedule one, or one of those times or they'd be cut off from the nation. Here, too, we need to understand the importance of the Lord's Supper is that we tarry one for another so that we can all be together. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to go to the Lord's Supper because I got this issue that I'm dealing on or I just don't have time or I don't really care. Uh, they don't really take the Lord's Supper seriously. Some people say, well, I don't want to take it uh, and so I won't go. And that they never deal with their issues. They never deal with their problems. Uh, other people, they say, well, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to take it. Well, you need to go and you need to take it and you need to deal with your problems. And if you refuse to deal with your problems, that tells the church, hey, this person has missed however many Lord's Suppers, and there's something going on here. We need to, as a body, examine this individual. We need to help him to, be to allow himself to be open to the chasing of the Lord. Uh, and so we need to understand as the body of the Lord's Church, the Lord's Supper is very important. We need to tarry one for another. So in other words... That person who has no meal, who didn't know that they were taking the Lord's Supper, they need the opportunity to know. He says, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together in condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So notice there, he's dealing with people. If you refuse to be dealt with by the Lord, don't come. But if you acknowledge that you need to submit to the Lord's body, you come and allow yourself to be set in order. That's what Paul is talking about here. Let's go ahead and quickly look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, which is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28. And this is the words of Jesus. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So the baptism enters you into membership uh, after you, you said, I'm going to walk with the Lord, I'm going to be his disciple. And then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. The Lord's Supper is used for to be in unity with the Lord's body uh, to learn the things that have been commanded to you. So when we are together taking the Lord's Supper, we are acknowledging not necessarily that we are perfect, but rather that we are observing the things with the Lord's body. We are learning those things that God is teaching us. We are open and submitted to the Lord's body so that we can learn these things of the Lord. And he said he's going to be with us to the end of the world. He's going to be there with us uh, in those in, in that picture. And let's go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And so we see in the book of Acts chapter 2, the, the communion of the, the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 42. Maybe a little bit more than that. Let's go start at 41. He said in verse 41, Then they that glad to receive his word were baptized. So you get saved, you receive the word of God, and you get baptized. And the same day, and then you were added to them about 3,000 souls. You get saved, you get baptized, then you get added to the Lord's church. Now, baptism is, in my opinion, is not automatic membership, but it is a step into membership. Uh, and so you, you get saved, they get baptized. The salvation is a free gift from the Lord. 
the baptism is your declaration that you'll follow the Lord in discipleship, in, in His body and blood in Christ. Uh, and then the, because you've declared that, the, the church receives you and joins you to the body. Uh, they were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And notice this. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They are submitted to the body of Christ. The apostles are the authority of teaching doctrine in the church, and you submit to their apostles' doctrine. If somebody refuses to submit to the apostles' doctrine, then they're in heresies, they're in division of the Lord's body. And fellowship. Not only just the doctrine, but also in fellowship. So you've got doctrine, and you've got unity. Truth and unity, they go together. You can't have truth and ignore fellowship. Oh, that guy's not a believer, so I'm going to, that guy disagrees with me on this point, so I'm not going to fellowship with him. You got doctrine and unity, and in breaking of bread, you have the Lord's Supper, you have the breaking of bread, you have fellowship, you have togetherness, and in prayers, you have prayer one with another. And fear came upon every soul. Fear, you, you are judging yourself, you are considering your own soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. When we're in unity, you have strength and you have signs, you have pictures, uh, and then we're done by the apostles. And all that believed were together. We have to believe, we have to be in unity. And had all things in common. If I see there's a need, and if I have the ability to provide it, as James says, if God has, said, if God has provided to you something that your brother needs, and he lacks it, and then you say, go, be, go and be warmed and filled, and, and pray for that person, but yet you don't provide it, which God has provided to you to give to your brother, then you are not being part of the Lord's church. Now, obviously, you, you have some types of people that all they do is take, 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 take. The Lord says that they should eat their bread in quietness. The Lord said that they should uh, that they should take care of their own selves first, and then out of the bounty help one another. And they that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, obviously, this was a new church. They were, uh, the, the the Lord was getting it to the whole world, and these early believers got it to the whole world, and they were there for the whole world. So they, they had a greater sacrifice than we normally need to do today. Now, some, am I going to say, hey, sell everything that you have and give it to this local church? No, I'm not going to say that because you don't need that sort of sacrifice today. What you need is to serve the Lord where you've been put. Uh, but these early believers wanted to get to the whole world. And so they sold their possessions, not because that they wanted to give everything to the church, but rather because they also were living sacrifice themselves. They were going to leave their location and go to other parts of the world. That's why they sold their, their lands and their properties, was because they themselves were leaving. They weren't just going to hang out in Jerusalem and stay poor uh, and destitute. They were selling their possessions, gave it to the church, because they themselves of the church were going to be going uh, to spread the gospel. Uh, and they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were in unity, uh, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If we want to be a strong church, if we want to be a church that grows, we will take the Lord's Supper seriously. We will take it with importance. We will take it with the body. We will tarry one for another. Uh, and so we need to understand these important uh, acts are not for everybody, but they are for the body so that they can be strong, so that they can teach all nations whatsoever God has commanded us. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, again, Lord, the opportunity to consider your word, uh, the church ordinances as well, uh, these two important acts that you've given to us to, in like manner, take together, tarry one for another, and the importance of both for, for membership and the unity of the body. Lord, I pray that you'll just help us to have truth and unity together at all times. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.